All righty. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our very first Tableau Data Dev live stream. My name is Keisha Rose. I'm a developer advocate here at Tableau. And today, over the next hour or so, uh, I'll be showing you how to create a write back extension from start to finish. So you'll see the entire process of how to set it up. And by the time we're done, you'll see a fully working extension that I built here live. Um, of course, you guys are free to put in any questions or uh, feedback in the chat. I'll keep an eye on that as well. And I think you've already done the sound check. You guys already let me know that you can hear me, so I'm good with that. Um, but before we hop in, if you haven't already, uh, make sure you join our developer program just at developer.tableau.com. And from there, you'll get notifications about awesome events. We do both uh, online events like this one, uh, also in-person events like our hackathons. And we also get to see some new features before anyone else. And if you sign up, you also get a free developer sandbox site. So you can get your own site and online for free where you can test out all of our cool APIs. Now, let's talk about the project that I'm going to be working on today. So I wanted to think of something that would be simple enough that we could get done within an hour, but uh, translatable to other areas as well. So the project we're gonna be working on today is a maintenance request form. So pretend that we work at an apartment property management company and uh, we've got multiple properties and each property we've got different tenants and they're making maintenance requests. Then we've got different technicians and those technicians want to be able to see those requests and update them with different statuses, add comments, and assign technicians. Now, this idea can be related to almost anything. It's basically a, a, a task management or ticket management system. This could be for IT requests. This could be for uh, you know incident reporting, all kinds of things. This is just a simple example for today's live stream. So before I hop too far, I want to show you guys what the data looks like. So we've got the data in a SQL server, and our main table here <clears throat> is the requests table. So each time a new maintenance request comes in, we have the time of the request, um, some information about the description, and then our technicians we have assigned to each request. And then each request is, of course, related to a particular unit in the properties. So I'll talk about this a little bit more, but that's the idea of the structure of our database here today. Now, things that you're going to need if you wanted to build something like this on your own, of course, you're going to need Tableau Desktop. But actually, if you sign up for that developer program I was talking about earlier, you could just use the developer program site and you could build an extension there as well. Um, today, I'll be using uh, Microsoft SQL Server, just really basic. And of course, I also have the SQL Server Management Studio as well. And then you're going to need something to code in. I usually prefer Visual Studio Code. And then uh, you're going to need a web server as well to actually host your extension because it needs to be hosted somewhere. And that could be internal or external. Now, today, I'm going to be using Glitch for both my web server and my IDE as well. And you'll see why in a moment. I'll show you what that looks like. Basically, it's a really nice collaborative uh, live way of hosting applications. And it's super simple to get started. You guys can even watch along as I'm coding too. Now, some disclaimers. Uh, since I'm only trying to aim for an hour, I will not be teaching uh, you how to do JavaScript. I will hope that you know some of the JavaScript basics. I will, however, point you to where you can find more information if you're interested. Um, so I'll be showing you links along the way, but I'm not going to be teaching you JavaScript today. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention as well is that there's no such thing as a write back API. Uh, I've heard this a lot. People are saying, where do I find the documentation for Tableau's write back API? That doesn't exist. It's not a thing. Basically, things like the extensions API and some of our other tools enable you to do uh, write back to databases, which we know Tableau in general is read only. So it's, there's no API. It's allowing you to do write back, basically. Um, and again, just for brevity, uh, I'm not 
trying to do a full production application here today. So you're not going to see a lot of validation on inputs or error catching. Um, but of course, in a production uh, application, you would have those things. Now, lastly, while we do have a SQL Server that we're working with today, I wanted to expand your brains a little bit, use your imagination. It doesn't have to be a database. This could be connecting to anything that allows you to connect to it programmatically. It could be an application. This could be ServiceNow, for example, or a Workday. Whatever you can use, um, the principles are the same. I'm just using a SQL Server today because I have easy access to manipulate it how I want it to be. All right, that being said, let me show you what we're going to be building. So, take a look here at Tableau. So here I have a maintenance request portal. Um, I would, you can assume that our technicians and maybe the property owners are able to look at this data. They can see how many requests are open, brand new, how many are currently being worked on or have been at least assigned, uh, closed, and we can see you know, the most recent requests, where they're at, um, what units, what kind of areas are going on, you know, what's the problem? Oh gosh, this one, the toilet's clogged up. You know, we've got different issues going on at our fake apartment building. Now you might be saying, well, where is the extension? Well, that's what this little box up here is. So right now I just have the word initialized in there because this extension, the idea of it is to be hidden until you need it. So it's kind of like a headless uh, extension. There's not really a, a visual while you're not using it. You really only want it when you want to actually update information. So this we could actually have hidden, but just so you guys knew where it was, I just kept it there with the word initialized. So what happens is this is listening for any mark selection events. So specifically on this worksheet. So for example, let's say we have Sophia here who has been working on this issue. Um, looks like the bathtub is draining pretty slowly. That's a terrible thing to happen. Let's say she's finished this job, she wants to close it out. So we click on this mark and that extension is listening for that particular mark. Now I am using Glitch, so <laughs> the service isn't up yet. There we go. So now you can see we've got the specific maintenance request. So we're looking at the Palmer Lofts 2A, and we have that data represented here. I can see that it's assigned to Sophia. I'm going to change the status from in progress to closed. And if I wanted to, I could add some comments. But I'll go ahead and hit update. Once I hit that update button, I'm now automatically running a refresh on the data, and you'll see that we now have that particular uh, request is now closed. The data has been updated. I can see the comments here and the time that it was closed um, in the, the here as well. Cool. So that's what we're going to be building today. Let me go back in my slides. Now, just so you know, I'm going to put this in the chat here. Since I am using Glitch, what that means, not only is it a live coding and hosting application, it also means you guys can watch as I'm doing it. So if I go ahead and open up my browser here, <clears throat> if you go to that link I just sent you, you will actually be able to see. Oh, I see a couple of you guys are on there already. Awesome. You can actually watch here as well to see the code, copy and paste, etc. Now, if you're not familiar with Glitch, it's a wonderful website and you can create a project as simple as clicking on new project. So what I've done is I've started a new express project and what you would see here right now is the basics of what you would get when you start a brand new project in Glitch. So I've done nothing to this. Uh, that's not true. I did one thing. I did add my environment variables and I'll talk about those later, but basically all the fun secrets about my database, the server, the password, the username, I did add those beforehand. So if you're looking at it, you don't have access to my environment variables unless I was to give you access. So those are secret, but they're already set up for me. But everything else is exactly how you would see it if you went to Glitch and did new project. Okay. That being said, I think it's time that we get started. Let me open up my notes over here, make sure I'm good to go, and we can get this moving. There we go. And got my notes here, got my cheat sheet.
All right, so let's dig in. So when you create a brand new um, work, not project, project here on Glitch, you start off with Express. So Express is just a really nice framework that you can use for web applications. Um, it's pretty popular. I'm not going to go into how to use Express, but if you are interested in learning more, you can go to expressjs.com where you can learn more about that framework. And like I said, as I go through, I'll be showing you some links related to what I'm working on. So if you're interested in learning more, just take note of those. But what we're going to do here is set up how our application accepts data and sends data out. So let's just go through what we already have here. First, we're bringing in that Express module and we're setting up our application. We're just call it app. Then we're saying we want to use this public folder as our location for static files. So notice here on the left hand side, I've got this public folder and this is where you're going to find your uh, client side, uh, JavaScript, your CSS, things that are publicly available that are helping to run your application. This line here just basically says use this public folder as a way to actually load those files. The next thing we've got here is our first router. This is just the basic router. So if I go to this location, datadevlive.glitch, you'll see the basic glitch template. And this is just that same get slash router, basically the, the very main homepage is just showing the index. And then down here, we actually have uh, where the app is actually listening on the correct port, etc. So the first thing that I want to do is set up the rest of my application here. You'll see we have some views here as well. And what I'm going to be doing is be using a templating language. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be using EJS. And EJS allows you to pass in data, and then it'll fill out what you want in your index file or any of your HTML files here. Uh, the syntax is pretty simple, and I'll show you how that works. But the first thing we need to do in our server.js file here is actually add that uh, view engine. So we're going to go ahead and do app. Oh, let me get my notes here. This is why I need my notes. <laughs> App.set. And we're going to set our view engine to be EJS. Now you could use any templating that you'd like. Um, maybe you want to use Pug or something like that. And what's cool about Glitch, if you if you notice, my page over here is refreshing. Whenever I make a change here, Glitch will automatically update. And once I start actually building out some of the forms, you'll see what that looks like. Now, if I'm going to use EJS, I need to also make sure I'm actually including it in my uh, package here, in my application. Glitch makes it super easy. I can go to package.json. Here you'll see all of the things that are installed. Right now we've only got Express as our main dependency here. I can go ahead and add in my EJS templating package. There you go. Embedded JavaScript templates. Click that button. And that will restart my server and it will install EJS. So now later on, once we start using EJS, it'll actually function and work properly. Great, so that's good. Next, I wanna make sure that we also are encoding the data that we're getting in in a certain way as well. So normally, if you send a request to your application, you have to tell it how you want to parse that data. So I'm gonna be sending out some form data. So I wanna make sure that I'm able to actually access um, that form data. But I'm gonna go ahead and add that now, because I know I'm gonna need it later. So we're gonna do app.use. And we're going to say express.url encoded. And I do believe that they recently changed this, so you have to have extended um, that extended feature in there. But basically, this is just going to allow us to um, accept my form data in a nice, clean way later on. All right. One more thing I want to do is actually set up my views here to use that EJS templating. So to do that, we actually need to change the index.html and change this to be index.ejs. So I'm going to rename this .ejs. And then in my server here, instead of sending the, a file, I can actually just render that template. So I can say render index. Now, if I've done it correctly, Oh, we're still good. And you can see that that's been refreshing this whole time. Now, I actually can keep this 
in the same window here. Now, this doesn't mean anything. This is just the, the glitch default. But as I work on things, you can see errors happening here if I make something wrong or live updates as we continue. OK, so we have the basics of our Express application running. The next thing I want to do is actually start to bring in our database and those modules. So I'm going to use the Microsoft SQL node package. And you can just find this by searching MS SQL NPM. And here it's going to tell us all the ways that we can use this package. So first things first, I got to install it. Let's go back to our package.json here. I'm going to add in Microsoft SQL. Um, and by the way, I'm not looking at the chat just yet because I have my notes up, but I will be checking in periodically as I go along. <clears throat> so if you have any questions about something, please put it in the chat and then I'll, I'll check periodically and take a look at it and hopefully get those questions answered. I also have a, a panelist or two in the chat there as well. I know Gigi's in there, so she also can answer some of those questions too. So please feel free to ask away. So now that I've installed the uh, Microsoft SQL package, that module, I actually want to create a brand new file. I don't want to messy up my uh, server uh, file here. I want to have a brand new module. So let's start a new file here called database.js. And this is where I'm going to keep all of my functions to deal with the database. So the first thing that I'm going to want to do is make sure I'm actually importing that uh, module the ms sql module so first things first bring that in and just require it there we go I'm trying to make sure i don't do any typos also if you notice a typo again put it in the chat so let me know <laughs> now once I've done that, I can actually access all of the cool functions that this node module has to offer. So if I was actually to look through, I can see we have examples here on how to set this up. And I'm going to just follow along with the sample because that's how I normally would actually do things. I, I'm, I don't know off the top of my head, so I'm going to look at the sample and see what it says. So the first thing I can see here is that we need a configuration object. This is what's going to hold all of our information about the database. I'm going to go ahead and just copy this from the notes there and paste it in here. And what I can do is actually add in my own pieces here. So before I continue, though, let me go ahead and check on the chat real quick. Oh, you guys are doing great. No questions. My goodness. Either I'm doing really great or you guys are really shy. But <laughs> we're good to go. I'll keep cruising along here. So my username, password, and server I already have in the environment variables. And to access those, you call process.env for environment. And then whatever you named the actual environment variable. So just to give you an idea of what that environment uh, file looks like. This is, of course, fake. This isn't real. Just in case you couldn't tell, my password is not called password. But this is exactly what it looks like in that environment file. So I have database server, username, and password. And that's a secret file that you can uh, access. So if I go back in here, I can say my user is db user. Password here password and the server is server. Now, my database that I created, I just called it data dev, of course. Make sure that's in quotes. And we're good to go. So moving on, again, just taking a look at the sample here. We can see that there's a couple things we need to do. So the first thing we need to do is create a connection pool. So right here, I can use SQL.connect with that config file that I just created. And from there, you can send in your requests and your queries. So let's just start with a really simple one. I want to get my technicians. If you remember in the uh, full sample here that we have a list of technicians. And this list I want to populate by pulling that data from the database. So we can start off with that as our first uh, function here. So I'm going to start off as well, just copy this, because why not? This is exactly what we're going to be doing. So if the first thing I want to do is actually export a module. I'm going to call it get technicians. So we're going to say module.exports. 
and we're just going to call it get technician. And from here, I can just say, I don't necessarily need to pass anything in. I'm just getting the list overall. I have four technicians, so I just want the entire table. And what I want to do, well, we're going to start with what we have from that module. So let's take a look here. The first thing we'll say is we're going to set up the pool. Now, you notice that we have this await here, and it's giving me this error saying, hey, this is being used in a function that's not asynchronous. That means we want to make this entire function asynchronous. We can do that easily by adding async right here in the beginning, and that error goes away. What this will do is it'll actually wait for this connection pool to get uh, resolved. And once that happens, then we can move on to producing our result. So if we're making a get technicians function, we want to actually, of course, get the technician. So let me type out my query here. And this is just going to be really simple. It's just going to be select all from technicians. Remember, that was my table that I had. If I bring that back up, we're just selecting everything from that technician's table. And again, I should have added to my disclaimer, this is also not a SQL tutorial. <laughs> but there we go, we have our query. And now I can add this to my request. So I can say request.query query. Now let's just make sure that this is actually working. We're just going to test it out. I'm just going to console log that result data set. All right, so not getting any errors, looks good to me. Let's go ahead and test this function. So to do this, we need to call it from our server.js file. And before you can bring anything in, I actually need to require my new database module. So I'm going to go ahead and say const db equals require database. And you don't have to add the .js to it, just the database there is fine. So now that I have that, I'm going to add this into this function here on my, my index page. And I'm just going to say db.getTechnicians. It doesn't take any parameters, and I just want to try it. Oh, let's see. Let's refresh that page. My project has received too many requests. My goodness, I think you guys are overloading the system here. But let's see, am I getting anything? So to look at the console log and glitch, you use the tools here at the bottom. And you can click on logs. And let me try opening this over here in a new window. Oh my goodness gracious. Well, I'm wondering if maybe it's because you guys are all on the page. So it's unfortunate that I, I'm going to have to try and change this. Let me see here. What if I change the name of this? Does that get you guys off? No. Still nothing. Oh, my goodness. I might have to kick you guys off. What do you guys think? <laughs> let's see. I'd love to take a look here in the chat real quick. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, okay, uh, just to answer a couple questions, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna copy over the project here real quick and see if I can start fresh. Thankfully, with Glitch, I can just hit Remix and I can remix this project. Don't join the new one, I'm sorry. I was hoping that you guys could watch along as I was doing it in that project, but it looks like that might be overloading the project. Um, there we go, okay. And let me just go ahead and add those environment variables. I'm gonna turn off the stream real quick and just copy that information and we can jump back into it. Um, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, actually, I went back and it, it it's working again. Okay, it looks like a bunch of you had, had popped off. Awesome. So we're, we're back again. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I, I was hoping you could watch along and kind of move through the files as I was doing it. However, um, so don't, don't join the page because it looks like it's overloading the system. If it happens again, I will remix the page, but um, we'll see. We'll see how far we can go. Um, but even either way, all of this code will be available to you at the end, and you will be able to go through all of these pages on your own. So hopefully we won't have that problem again. If it does, I'll have to just ask you guys to hop off. 
But going back into what we were working on, um, so here I was calling that get technicians function from our database module that we just created, remember? And all it's doing, and not sending anything yet, I just want to see what that result looked like. And as you can see down here, I actually have the record set being output, and I can see I am getting the technician information. So it comes just as a nice uh, JavaScript object here for all my different items, and I can see that I did successfully get that information. Um, I did see a question in the chat real quick, so let me take a pause and a sip, and let's see what's going on over here. Okay, so a couple questions. Um, yes, just to reiterate, this is being recorded, and we will have this up on YouTube after um, once it gets, you know, uh, once I have it uploaded. And I also will have on that YouTube link, I'll have the um, resources, so all the links, etc., to get started will be there too. Um, semicolon after the database here. Um, you don't really need semicolons really in JavaScript. You you should put them there, but you're not necessarily going to break things, at least not most of the time. Sometimes you will break things, but most of the time, if you miss a semicolon, you're usually fine. But thank you for pointing it out, because I'm sure I'll typo something at some point. So if that happens, please, again, feel free to let me know. Um, somebody asked about just getting started on, on doing this type of thing. Um, we do have a lot of really nice tutorials and getting started information on our um, here we go on the extensions page here. Here you can get a nice tutorial on how to get started, what you'll need. So I would say this is a great place. I'll go ahead and copy this into the chat here. This is a great place to get started if you want to build your own extensions. And then if you want to just brush up on JavaScript in general, um, I'd recommend anything like Code Academy or uh, any online JavaScript, JavaScript.info, even W3 Schools is great. Uh, all of the above are great ways to just get started uh, with JavaScript. All right, so go back to my notes here. And I think we are good to continue. So I just finished, let me make sure I <laughs> find my place, uh, just finished testing out our get technicians. And what I actually want to do now is return that data, not just console log it. Now that I know it's working, I feel comfortable actually returning that data. And then back in my server page here, I can actually say, um, Let's return whatever that table is. Let's call it something. So I say, let's call it text. And again, since that get technicians function is asynchronous, I want to make sure that I'm waiting for that promise to resolve. And again, if I'm using a wait here, then I need to make sure I'm making this asynchronous here at the top. So I'll always keep those things in mind. Um, what I can then do is actually pass this data into my render function. So right now, this res.render is basically taking, um, it, in the response, it's basically taking the template index, remember that index, that EJS file we have over here, and it's going to render that with whatever template uh, I, I tell it to do later on as I add it. But I can also send it data as well. So I can say not just render this page, you know, whatever's on it, I can also send data. So I'm going to send it an object with our text in it. So once I start working on the template, you'll actually see I have access to that data that I got from Get Technicians. Cool. All right. Chugging along, we're making good time here. Um, the next thing I want to do is actually set up a uh, request here as well. So once I've got um, once I've got my page running, I want an endpoint that will actually say yes, I want to uh, pull data in or make the form or whatever. Right now, this index page, that's basically this page right here, and there's not really going to be anything happening on that page, at least to the eyes of the user, that page will be listening for any mark selection. But as far as the actual form, I want that to happen on a separate page. So we're going to set up that endpoint so we can have that page. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to copy what I've got right here. 
and start a new page. And we're going to call this request. And this is going to be actually what's called when I click on the button and open up that uh, dialog box. Now, when I open a request, I actually want to tell it which request to look at. So I can add a parameter to this page saying whatever request it is, um, that's what I want to look up in the database. So I can say request slash request ID. Now, if you start with a colon, that's saying we actually want this to be a parameter. So for example, if I were to change the URL of my page right here, so you see we're looking at our main index page here, right? Getting this uh, default glitch template. If I change this to match my new endpoint here, my new route to say request slash three, for example, I'm now getting that same index page, right? And what I want to do is I'm going to set up a brand new page that gets set here. But I wanted you to notice that the colon request ID is not actually part of the URL. It's saying whatever happens after the slash, count that as a parameter. And then I can use that parameter later on to get data for that specific request. OK, so I'm going to keep this page on that page for right now. And let's go ahead and start and set up our request page. So I want to create a new page. Just duplicate this here. And I'm going to call this request.ejs, remember, not .html. And we can get rid of most of the stuff that we have here in this glitch sample. Um, we can call this something different, say maintenance request as our title here. Uh, we don't really need a style sheet um, because I'm going to be using Bootstrap today. So try and make it as simple as possible. Don't need that. Now we do want a JavaScript file. And these are part of our public. Remember in the beginning, we set up that public folder to be our public facing or client side JavaScript and files. So I'm going to create a file here to match my request.ejs. And later on, we will start to add things um, to this. So for right now, I'm just going to rename it to be request. And we don't need to do anything, so I'm going to delete all of that from the glitch template. I also don't need this style uh, CSS. Just going to delete that because we don't need it. And going back into my request here, I am going to be using uh, Bootstrap. So if you're not familiar with Bootstrap, let me go ahead and open that page up here. Here we go. So Bootstrap is just a really nice um, component framework. And just for today, because of time's sake, normally I would uh, style my own inputs. But Bootstrap is really nice, super simple, and we can get started really quickly. So I'm going to be using Bootstrap. So the first thing I need to do is actually bring in that library. I'm going to go ahead and just copy this handy dandy CDN down here and paste that in. Make sure I update my JavaScript file to match. Not going to touch it quite yet, but later on it will be set up for us. And then I also want to bring in um, jQuery here as well. So I'm just going to do that from now. Lucky me, I have that on my handy dandy uh, <laughs> toolkit here, just ready to go. So I've got, oop, wrong one jQuery. There we go. I've got this shortcuts tool that I got from Gigi. Shout out to Gigi. She sent this to me. Um, it's really handy. You can just use slash slash keyword and it'll paste in things that you need, which is great for things like live streams. We don't want to remember some of the longer things to type. So I've added in the Bootstrap CSS for our styling. I've got jQuery in here set up for some of our uh, coding later on. And I've got my request.js set up. OK, so I think we are all set. Again, checking my notes. I don't want to miss anything. And I think we can probably get started. So if we look at Bootstrap and how it works, first things first is they have a um, layout or a grid style layout. So basically, you can put things into rows and columns, which is super easy for today. So I'm going to be using a very similar layout style. But if you're wondering where she got those classes from, that's how I'm using it. So let's start off by building out a skeleton of that form. So I'm going to get rid of all of this stuff from Glitch. And as you see, 
if I make sure I'm actually on the right page. Oop, one thing I forgot to do, if you can tell this is a live demo, make sure you actually render the page that you want. So just because I call this request.ejs, and just because we're over here at request, does not mean we're looking at that particular file. It's not like request.html, where if you go to website.com slash request.html, you get that page. It's different. Here, I'm sending you something specifically from this endpoint, and I can tell you what I want. So make sure I put in request so that you actually get, wait for it, come on, refresh, ah, oh, it's live, oh, maybe, so close. There we go, blink, as I just deleted everything from the request page, and now we have it up to date. So if I start typing stuff over here, we'll see that that, that page on the right-hand side will actually update eventually. Cool. Go ahead and take a quick pause just to see any questions. Let's see. Oh, we got Ben in the chat too. Awesome. Oh, great. Good, 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 good. Okay, got, a, got some good folks in the chat there to help you guys out for any questions. Awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and start to build out the skeleton of that um, form. So this form that we have here. So we're gonna include things like the um, request name and the, the technicians, the descriptions, the units, all of that stuff. So before I actually bring that data in, I'm just gonna kind of block out what I want to happen here. So the first thing you want to do is start off with that container. Remember I mentioned I'm using the Bootstrap grid system. So I'm going to start off with a div. And just have that be a container. And that will hold the entirety of that form. Then I'm going to start off with a new, um, actually, before I even get that, let's just start off with a header, you know, maintenance request. So we know what we're looking at. There we go, maintenance request. And one thing I will do, just because I like things to be a little cleaner, the one piece of styling I'm gonna actually add to this is just a little bit of a margin at the top here. So let's just do a quick margin, just because that looks like it's really close. There we go, nice, okay, that's the beginning of our form. Next thing I wanna do, let's take a look, um, was, oh, I'll just tell you. Next thing you wanna do is our request time. What time did the request actually come in? So let's start a brand new row. And make sure that's a div, not a dove. Although I'm sure it'd be nice. That'd be interesting. If I could have some doves in my, my code, that'd be cool. And then we're going to start a new row, a new column. And for right now, I'm just going to put in request time. Because I don't have the data quite yet, I'm just going to do the scaffolding. And then we're going to go back and actually put in the data based on whatever request ID you pull in the URL. So first up, I've got my request time, and let's add another column here for the, um, what was next? The actual, oh, the property names and the unit. So property name and unit will go in there. And I actually wanna make sure that that kind of scoots over a little bit to the left. I'm just gonna put this on auto. There we go, okay, nice. So we've got that first row of information. The next row of information I want is the area and the description of the problem. Is it a leak in your bathroom? Is it something wrong with your dishwasher in the kitchen? So let's add in just a paragraph here for area and another one for the description. I might actually add in a little bit of a line break here just to space those out a little bit better. Nice, okay, moving along. Now, the next thing I wanna do, let's go ahead and just Grab this code here at the top, make my life a little easier. The next thing I want to do is add in the dropdown that we have for technicians. So what I'm going to do is actually go ahead and go to Bootstrap, and they have a bunch of components that we can use, and I'm going to use their dropdown components. So what's super easy about Bootstrap is they give you the code based on what the samples are. So I can go ahead and just copy this whole div right here and make it my own. So if I paste that in, you now see we have a nice little drop down. And what I want to do here, let's tab that in for a little bit easier reading, is I'm going to give it a name. So first I'm going to say this is the list for technicians. Let's call it techs. And 
put that over here as well. I also need to make sure that I'm including that as the name as well, because when we submit the form, it's going to look for input names, not input IDs. So key point. Um, and we're going to label this assigned to. Now, right now, we've just got these options. I'm going to come back to that and fill those in with our actual technicians. But I'm going to move along just to set up the rest of our scaffolding here. So I'm going to just copy one of these. Actually, I'll put it right next to it. I'll copy this column. And this one will be the status. So we'll put status. Make sure you change your IDs, your names here. And that label basically just says that this is the label for the select with the ID status. All right, and here we go. I'm telling you, using Bootstrap just makes it super simple. I don't have to worry about spacing. It's responsive. If I make this smaller, like it fits, it's, it's great. Um, moving along, though, we'll come back to the rest of this. So we can close that out. And the last thing I want to do here is add a box for the comments and add the button to actually update the record. So next, I'm going to put in a, another one of those rows down here. And this time, again, just going to copy from Bootstrap. Again, why not? Make it easy on myself. I'll just grab this text area, which will give us a nice big box for comments, and paste that in. And my code is looking all kinds of janky, but hopefully you guys can follow along. It's not too, too terrible. There we go. Now, in this one, again, make sure you're updating your IDs and your labels. This one I'll just call comments. Keep it simple. And make sure to do the name here as well. All right. Comments. So we've got that set up. One more last one is just the button. So I'm going to copy this again. And this time, what do you know? I'm going to go back to Bootstrap, grab a button, and I'll just use this one. This looks fine. And paste that in. And on this one, I also actually want this to float to the right side because why not that's just what i wanted to do so using their nice classes boom to the right okay so this is the basic scaffolding of our form the next thing we need to do is actually add that information from the database based on whichever uh request id we're looking at so just to show you how we do that this is where we're using EJS, that templating language I mentioned at the beginning. That's what's going to allow us to actually place that information. So if I go back to our server page, just to remind you, I'm passing in text here. I also don't need to have this up here. I can get rid of this. Don't need that anymore. There we go. I'm passing in the technician information as text here. And I can actually access that data that I'm passing from the database in my template up here. Okay, so quick pause, check in on questions, anything? Looks like there's some pretty good chat going on. Um, some do, 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 do. La, la, la. Oh, great question. Um, yeah, so someone asked why I'm using Glitch. Can uh, GitHub be used as well? Oh, yeah, GitHub would be great too. Uh, the reason I like using Glitch is that I can see the edits um, happening live as I make them. So if I change something here, it, it happens instantly versus having to do like a push up to GitHub. But, um, you know, GitHub's perfectly fine too. Yeah, that works. Um, one thing though, I will say this particular example is using some server side um, code and GitHub does not support that. It would only be client side stuff. So only static files. So that is one downside to using GitHub. But uh, our extensions that we host for Tableau and the gallery, they're all hosted on GitHub. So for the right use case, perfectly acceptable. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. What is my favorite programming language? Oh, goodness. Uh, I don't know. I, I tend to work with JavaScript a lot. So I don't know, maybe I'll use that. But anything really could work, really, as long as you can interact with our 
extensions API library, you're pretty much good to go. So anything that you can use with that, it'll work fine. OK, moving on. So let me make sure I'm caught up with my notes. I don't want to lose my place. All right, perfect. OK, so now that we've got that set up, let's go ahead and start actually pulling in the information there. So let's start here with text because I already have that data. So how do I actually access that data? So if you look at the EJS documentation, pull that up. What you do is you use these um, tags. So you use the tags like an open carrot. Oops, excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, an open carrot and then parentheses. And then depending on how you want the output to be placed, you can use a, a variety of different symbols. And then you put in whatever you want for your JavaScript. And then you close it again with those same symbols. So if I try that over here, just for example's sake, I'm going to put in an, a cute little script tag here, and we're going to console log uh, text. So I'm going to start off with that percentage open and closing bracket notation that I mentioned. And in this case, I want to actually spit out the data um, without it being URL encoded. And that means I use a dash. You can look at the documentation on the EJS website, and it'll tell you if you use a dash, then you get the values unescaped. Sometimes you might want to use an equal sign, which in which case you will have them escaped. Um, other times you want to use none of that just because you want to use it as a, as a script flow. But for this case, I'm actually putting that data out with no encoding, and I'm good to go. And I'm going to say JSON stringify text just so I can have that log out to the console. I'm going to go ahead and clear all this and refresh the page. And here we go. We have that data. So we can see here I'm getting all that technician data. And I'm going to clean this up a little bit um, because when I'm using the, the, the Microsoft SQL database module, it sends you everything. It sends you the rows affected and multiple record sets. I don't need all of this extra, so I'm actually going to say I only want to return record set in my database file here. So I'm going to return the result dot record set, and that is just whatever the first record set is. So once I have that, you can see now I got a new output, and it's only giving me that actual data. Awesome. So now that I know this and I have my structure of my data here, I can start using that to fill out the template for my data. So let's get rid of these options here. And we're actually going to put in the options based off of EJS data that's coming in. I also don't need this. That was just to show you guys what that looked like. So for every select, you need to have options. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start again here with my tags. And I need, to, I need to double check because I don't want to do it wrong. There we go. I'm using this. Now, we're going to take text, which is that array of data we have right here that I just showed you. From there, I want to actually map this out for every single option to become an actual HTML option. So for each item in my array, I'm going to spit out a new transformed string that will recreate that option for us. So I can just use the map function in JavaScript. They'll take an array, do some transformations to it, and spit out values for the same amount of things in that array. So I can say dot map, and I can say for every single tech within that technician's array, I want to spit out some options. So I'm going to start off with my option tag. All right. And right now you see I'm not getting anything, but we do see four empty option tags. That means every single tech that's on my list, I have four technicians, I'm getting an empty option tag. Now, of course, we actually want to see the names of the technicians. So we're going to put in their names using this little JavaScript piece here. And I can say the tech dot technician name. Let's see if that works. 
Aha, now we have the actual technician names that are being pulled from the database. Now, when I submit this form, I don't actually want to submit the name. I want to submit an ID. So I'm going to say the value over here for each option is actually the technician ID, which you won't see in the actual drop down here at all. But when I submit it, I'll get that number and not the string instead. Now, that looks pretty good to me, and I think we can move on to our next piece. Now, the thing is, I want to make sure I'm pulling up the correct technician. Um, I also maybe don't have a technician assigned, so I'm going to actually add in a blank option here as well. So, new option. I'll have the value set to just be a blank string, which will come up as null in my database. And I'm just going to say, this means it's not assigned to anyone. All right, so now I have a default as not assigned, and I can choose from the different technicians here. Cool. Now, the most important piece is that we need to actually get the data about the request. I need to know the request time. What's the status? Were there any comments? What's the description? So we're going to go back to our database and create a new function that pulls in the request data. So let's go back to database. And we're going to make a new function here. So we're going to say module.exports. And this one I'll call, call it get request. Now this one I do have something that I want to take. I want to take the request ID. So request ID will be my input variable here. And from there I can start to build out my same uh, query. So I'll copy and paste that down in here. Now again, make sure we're actually making this an asynchronous function, right? So we can wait on those promises to resolve. Now, in this one, I am going to cheat just for time's sake. I know I've, <laughs> I've been doing most of the typing this entire time, but um, I don't want to go through all this entire of SQL trying to teach you SQL, but I will tell you what it is. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling in the request ID, the time, all the different pieces of information that are relevant to this form, and I'm doing that on a join that I have based off of the requests, joining in the units and the properties, and joining in the technicians. And the most important thing, though, to note here is that we have this at request ID. And basically, this is going to say whatever request ID I pass in. Matter of fact, I'm going to rename this just for confusion's sake, because it's a little bit different. Whatever request ID I pass in, that's the one I want to pull from a database. So how do we do that? Well, we need to actually add in an input to our request. So down here, I'm going to say input. And we're going to call it the same thing that you call this variable. So this new variable we'll call request ID. And what variable are we passing in? Well, we're passing in whatever request ID I send from my application. Now, why am I using input here instead of just putting in request ID uh, using JavaScript in here? By using the input function, you're actually going to sanitize that input so no one can do, you know, Johnny drop tables on you. But uh, So make sure you use actual input functions here and not just uh, hard coding strings. All right, so that looks good. I think we're pretty much set. Let me double check myself over here. Yep, checking with my notes. Okay, so... This time we're going to go ahead and we only are going to get one request, uh, one request. So I'm going to just make sure I only return that one request. Let's go back to our server. Similar to getting the technicians, I can now say, let's get our request. And we're going to say get request, which is our new function. And make sure you pass in that actual request or else it's not going to work. Remember, the request ID is being pulled in from the URL. So to access that request parameter, I can say request. And when I say request here, I mean the actual application request, not my maintenance request. I can get the parameters, and I'll just get request ID. So it's pulling in whatever I pass in in this part of the URL right here and passing that in to my get request uh, function. I can then also return that data in here as well, and we should be able to see it in our request uh, HTML over here. So just to test it out, I'll make another script 
function here, a little script piece. Console log. And we're just going to do json.stringify request. Make sure I don't forget my closing brackets. I think we're good. Oh, there it is. Let me just clear this out so you guys can see this a bit clearer. But here I have that request. So everything is working great. Pulled in the request information from the database. And I can see based off of this request. So note that I'm getting request ID, which is for unit 401 in the Terra building. If I change this number to, so let's say, request 5, I'm now going to get a new request for a different request from the different apartment. So whatever I put in here, it's going to get passed as a parameter here, which is going to get passed into my data request over here. Sound good? Cool. Moving along, now that I have access to this request information, I can now start to fill in all the different pieces that I had scripted out or kind of scaffolded out earlier. Before I do, take a quick peek at the chat, see how we're going. All right, let's see, looking good. Yes, sweet. Oh yeah, uh, it looks like someone already answered this, but just for the, the chat here, someone asked about using a Snowflake database. Absolutely, you can definitely use the Snowflake database. All you need is some kind of way to programmatically interact. And I'm pretty sure that they have their own uh, node module as well. So any flavor of database that you can interact with like, like that, Sure, you can use an application. This could be to ServiceNow, this could be to Workday, this could be anything. All you need is the ability to run those queries. All right, looking good, so I'll go back. And now I'm gonna start actually filling in all of this information. So let's start at the top here, our request time. Um, let's just go ahead and bring that in. This time I can use the equal sign. If you remember, the equal sign means it will be URL encoded, that's fine. I can say request dot request time. And remember, we're getting that from the data that's being pulled in from a request here. Make sure I close that up. Aha, there we go. I'm now getting the request time from our request based on the request ID I've set in. Um, and just to make this look a little bit nicer, because this looks kind of janky, I'm just going to add this locale string to it. So it looks a little bit nicer. Great, okay. And I can kind of make this a bit smaller here, make that a bit wider, nice, okay, great. So next up, let's add our property name. I'm gonna just copy this so I can make it a little bit easier on myself. This time we want property name. And there we go, this request is coming from the alpha apartments. Same thing for unit. There we go. Awesome, moving along. Um, let's do the same thing here for our area. We'll say request area and the description. Cool, cool. I might just add these with the bold around them. Actually, no, I'll skip it for now for time. Um, moving on, technician. So right now, if I was to look at this request, um, so 121 here at 8 p.m., um, I can see that this request is assigned to Roger, um, but I'm not actually seeing that in our list here. So what I need to do is actually tell this dropdown based off of whoever's assigned in the request to set that drop down to that person. So what I'm gonna do is add a selected tag to the appropriate option. So in here, the selected tag can just be added inside the options tag. So for example, I could just put selected like that, but I wanna only do that for the one that's actually selected, right? So in that case, I'm gonna put in another little scriptlet here. And we're going to say, does the ID of the technician, so tech technician ID, does that equal whoever has been assigned as the request that technician ID? So request dot technician ID. If it does, then put selected. If it doesn't, then leave it blank. 
And now you see that we're getting Roger because that particular request is being has been served by Roger. Swap this out to number three. Oh, let's try. Are they all Roger? No, there we go. Okay, number four is Nadia. So as you get that data, it's up, it's updating this uh, drop down to reflect it as well. Um, let's do the same thing again for our status. Um, in this case, I'm actually going to copy this again just to save my time. There's no there's no need to re reinvent the wheel here. We're going to start over with the same thing we've got here with our text, but instead of pulling in the technicians, I'm actually going to pull in some strings. Now, in a real application, you would um, you would actually be pulling this data from the database, but just for time's sake, I'm just going to pull it from the array because I know there's only three values. So we have requested, in progress, and closed. So I can say that from that array, we can map out our statuses. So for each of these statuses, I can say the value will be the status itself. And we want to check if it's selected based on if the status is equal to the request's status. And then finally, we'll put in the actual status name there as well. OK, so now we're getting the list of statuses. And I can see that that one is closed. If I try one of our newer ones, we can see that that one is requested, hasn't been assigned. If I try 19, that one's in progress. So it'll pull in the appropriate um, information there. All right, one more. I've got to just make sure I have my comments brought in here as well. So we're going to put that into the uh, request here. But that one's pretty simple. I can just copy one of these more simple ones at the top and just paste that in here for comments. So for this one, it's request.technician comments. And that should bring up our comments. Great. All right. so. We're almost there. <laughs> we're going a little over time, but I think we're, we can still get it done, maybe 20 minutes. So the last thing I want to do here is set up our button. Make sure I put that to set to update. And we actually don't want to use the default form that you would uh, form actions. I actually want something to happen when I click that button. So I'm going to add an on click event here. And I'm just going to call my function what I call it uh, update. Sure. Now, again, I want to make sure that I'm passing in which request I want to update. So I'll pass that in here as well as the request ID. So later on, this function doesn't exist yet. I'll be putting it in the request.js file. But once it does exist, it'll capture the current request ID and send and update the right record in my database. OK, checking in one more time, just at the chat. Looking good. OK, sweet. Let's go back. So check my notes again here. La la la. We've done that. We connected to the request data. Oh, we've gone quite quite far away. OK, great. We did all our inputs. We set that up. Nice. OK, so let's then next add the actual update function that I want to work on here. So what I want to happen is when I hit this update, this update button, I want to run an update function that's going to grab all the data that we've put in here and send it to update my database. So we're going to go ahead and create this update function in our request.js file. So in here, what I want to do first is just go ahead and say update, brand new function. And remember, I'm passing in the request ID. And what do we want this to do? Well, the first thing we want this to do is actually grab these pieces. So we need the technician that's assigned to, the status, and the comments. So we're going to pull those in as variables. So say let tech equals, and I'm going to use jQuery just as a really easy way to grab the data from those inputs. And remember how I had um, assigned those names and IDs here? That's what we're pulling in right now for jQuery. So text, status, and comments is what we're pulling in here. So I'll say text, whatever that value is. And then we'll do the same thing for status.
and that value. And I'm just going to copy that to make it go faster. For the next one, we'll do the comments. Okay, so now that I have each of those pieces, I can then send that data to my server to say update that information. But um, let's go ahead and set that up first here, and then I'm going to set it up in the actual server. So I'm going to be using uh, some jQuery here. And just so you can get an idea of what that looks like, we're going to be using jQuery.post. Uh, and basically, you can just pass it the URL you want to send data to, what data you're sending, and then a function to do once it successfully has returned. So here, we're going to say .post. And I'm going to send this to update. And I'm going to include the request ID. So I'm specifically updating that particular request. I'm then going to send the data. Say tech status and comments because that's the data I want to send to actually update it. And then I'm actually going to, when I return, have a function. For right now, I'll just alert, you know, woohoo. <laughs> Later on, we'll tie it into the, the actual extension. Now, this update endpoint that does not exist yet on my server if I tried to do this right now I'd get an error saying that update could not be found so let's go ahead and fix that by creating a new endpoint in our server.js file over here now remember I'm using post so make sure that that's a post request this time we're looking at update and I still want my request ID here so that's fine we can keep that and then this time I don't need to get any data from our texts or requests, but I do want to um, update data. So I'm gonna comment this last piece out here for a second. And I actually want to create a new database function that'll take the data that we're getting from the form and update it. So modules.exports. Um, let's call this update request. As you know, it's going to be asynchronous. And this one, I do have information that I'm getting. Not only do I have the request ID, but I also have the actual data that's being updated from the form. OK, so in this function, again, don't need to recreate the wheel here. We're just going to copy from above and modify. Um, and again, I am going to cheat and use my already existing SQL here, but it's pretty straightforward. We're going to be updating our request table. So I'm going to paste that in. There we go. So we're updating our request table, and we're going to set the technician ID, the status, and any comments based on the variables we're going to get from data, where the request ID is equal to whatever request ID I've selected. Now, we already have the request ID input here, but we don't have the requests, the inputs for the other ones. So I'm going to add these as inputs. So we're going to do input tech ID. And right now, I'm going to just say data.tech, which will be passing from our application. Status, data.status. And then comments, just data dot comments. Um, and just to make this a little bit cleaner, I'm going to format this so you can see these inputs a little bit clearer. So we've got our re request pool. And then from each of those, we've got we're passing in the request ID that we'll get from hitting that update button, as well as the data for the tech, the status, and the comments. These three things, the tech status comments, is what's getting sent here, tech status comments from those inputs. Cool. So moving along, um, let me just double check myself here again. Now, the thing about this update function is that we're not actually getting any record set. So there's no record set to send. But what I could do here is say, um, tell me how many rows were affected. So what I can do is say, however many rows are affected, it'll return an array with a number. So I'll get that first number. And basically, this should equal uh, one, because we're updating one request at a time. So what I can do with this function is just return, did you update something? In a real production thing, you probably do more validation than that. But for today, it'll work. Now, going back to our server, let's make sure that this is all connected. 
So now I'm going to bring in that update. So it's very similar to above. The let update equal an await because remember we're waiting on our asynchronous function. And we're going to do db.update request and make sure to pass in those two uh, arguments here, request ID and the data. So again, request ID is coming from the actual URL. So that is a parameter we can pass in. And then the data will be passed in as the request body. And the reason we get that is because we have this URL encoded middleware at the top here that's actually parsing that for us. So we can say request.body, double check, yep. And that will pass in the tech ID, the status, the comments. Cool. As far as what I want to respond with, I don't really need to render a page or anything like that. So I'm just going to send update, which is just a result of did you update something? Did you return at least, you know, did you return exactly one record? So that's all I'm going to pass back. So that should be good. Let's go back to our request here. And first, let's just see if this is working. So I'm going to change, um, let's see, I'm on number five. Let's just change this to in progress. And let's see here, if I update that, first of all, we get the woohoo, nice. And if I refresh the page, aha, we still have in progress. So I now have actually sent an update back to the database based on those inputs. <clears throat> now, what I want to happen is when I do that, in Tableau, I actually want to refresh and close that tab. And you'll notice I haven't even really touched Tableau yet, but that's what we're going to get into now. So when I said before that right back really isn't an API, it's a, it's a feature, or it's not a feature, it's a thing you can do that's enhanced or enabled by the extensions API. Most of the work we've done so far has just been in the application and not even touching the Tableau environment yet. But we're going to do that right now. So what I want to happen here actually is to close the pop-up, okay? And what I also want to happen is that we want this to be listening for some mark selections. So at this point, I'm gonna open up Tableau and this here was our finalized one. I'm gonna get rid of that. And I'm now gonna bring in the, actually, let me make sure I change that name back because I think I had changed the name, didn't I? Yeah, we're gonna put this back to, live because that's the TRX that I have. So <laughs> we're going to now bring in our extension. Okay, there we go, live. Yep, good, looks good. And remember that default, we still have that default happening. So let's go ahead and get rid of all that stuff over here in our index. You can just delete all of this body stuff. And I'm just going to put initialized. Okay, if I come back over here, hit reload, I now see initialized. So at least we're connected, we're looking good. And we're just going to keep that over here so I know when things are reloading, I know when it's fully reloaded. So first, let's set up our request closing. Now, this is you're not going to get to see this work until the end, but I'm going to just set this up from now. First thing we need to do is, of course, bring in the Tableau extension library. So on my request page here, I'm going to bring that library in. I'm going to be using the CDN we have for sandbox extensions. Um, doesn't matter. You can bring that in locally if you wanted to. It doesn't matter what you bring in, but I'm going to bring it in from there. And I now have access to it over here. And I can say Tableau initialize. Now, how do you know? Um, what to actually use to initialize Tableau. Well, let me open up, I can just open it up here. Our reference. So in the documentation here, in our reference, you'll see how to get set up. So the first thing you wanna do always is initialize Tableau. So I'm gonna just copy that right from here, paste it in, and we're good to go. One thing you might notice with uh, Glitch is that it doesn't have the reference that you do that we included over here. So it's it's gonna tell you, uh, I don't think Tableau exists. That's not a module, that's not a library, that, et cetera. You can just type in global Tableau, just to let it know that Tableau does exist, that library does exist in our application and it gets rid of that error for you, if you notice that. 
So now that that's set up, we want to also add in the close pop-up piece here as well. How do I do that? Well, I can look at the reference for our UI. And here I can say that close dialog, and it requires a payload. So I'm just going to copy that here as well. And for my payload, I'm actually going to send the status of updated. That was, again, determining if the number of rows affected equals one. I can return, yes, we've successfully updated something. Now, I'm not going to show you how this works. We'll come back to this later. So for right now, I'm going to work on the index. That's this page that we see right here with initialized. That's what's going to be doing some of the heavy lifting. It needs to listen to the mark selections that happen on this worksheet and pop open the dialog box. So if we go back in here, again, don't need my style sheet. That doesn't even exist anymore. Um, I do need the, um, the Tableau library, the extensions library. And I'm going to use index.js, which hasn't been created yet. So I'm going to make that file over here. OK. So delete that. We're now working on a new file that's linking to our index.ejs file here. So this is where we're going to listen to those mark selections. So as usual, first thing we do, initialize Tableau. And what I want to do, though, once I've set that initialization, I want to actually do some things to um, set up the environment. I want to turn on that event list. I want to start listening to things. So I'm going to say, once that's initialized, let's go ahead and start listening. So the, what you have to do is grab the worksheet that is on this dashboard. And to get a worksheet, you have to grab worksheets. If you take a look at our documentation here for the reference, you'll see we have, where is it? There we go. The first tidbits of getting worksheets for you right here. So we're going to grab that, and we're going to say let worksheets equal Tableau. And again, just to get rid of those a little bit of annoying errors there, I'm just going to add that global. Nice. OK. So we're going to say let worksheets equal Tableau.extensions.dashboardcontent.dashboard.worksheets. It's a lot. It's a mouthful, but we're going from the high level of the dashboard all the way down to the worksheets. Then from here, what I can do is select um, my specific worksheet. So I can say let worksheet equal, and I can just find within that array of worksheets my specific one. So worksheets where the worksheet name is equal to requests. Now in here, you can see that this worksheet is called requests. Again, normally you're probably going to hard code that in there, but for today we will. And also, um, if you're curious on what information gets passed when you get a worksheet, like how do I know that I, I can look for name on a worksheet? You can look at the reference here and see that we get the name, the size, and some other functions that we'll use later. So I can just say, that worksheet is mine. And once I have that worksheet, I can then add a event listener. So here, looking at that method, add event listener, you add the event type. On what event do you want this function to happen? And then you tell it what function to run. So we'll say, add event listener specifically which one we're going to add. We're going to add the worksheet mark selections changed event. So here we're going to go tableau dot, what is it, tableau event type dot mark, sele mark selection changed. And when that happens, we're going to run a function that I haven't created yet, but we're going to call it edit. OK. Down here, we'll create that edit function. Cool. And right now, nothing's going to happen. But let's just go ahead and alert something. Uh, yay. OK. So right now, if I go ahead and open this in Tableau, if I reload this, this index page now has all that new, nice JavaScript with it. And if it works correctly, Yay, there we go. So it's listening for any mark selections on this particular worksheet. If you click on anything else, it's not going to work. It's looking specifically for mark selections on that particular worksheet. And even deselections will also in be included here as well. 
So good. So far, so good. We're working. I'm going to take a quick peek at the comments. And we're almost done, by the way. I know we went a little over. I was trying to get this done in an hour, but I think it's going to be an hour and a half. Um, let's see. Yes, the code will be available after. Um, okay, no new questions. Awesome. I'll just keep chugging along. Let's, let's finish this up. So now that we have that set up, let's make sure we actually open this form. And remember, we want to open it to request slash the request ID. So this edit function is going to need to do a bunch of things. First, it's going to get the uh, request ID based on the mark that you selected. It then needs to pop up the dialog right, to get this form. And then it then needs to refresh the data so you can see the changes that you just made. And guys, that's all we have to do. Once we get those three things done, this entire application will be finished. So let's go ahead and grab the request ID. Now to do that, we have an event that gets passed with this function. Whenever you run this event, whenever this event happens, it's going to pass the actual event details. What worksheet did it happen on? What marks were selected? What's the data that is on that mark? So here we actually have event. That's what it's getting passed. Now with this event, I can get marks. If I go back to our reference here, just so you guys can find this later on. Um, doo -doo 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 where? Is it? It's alphabetical, Keisha. There we go. Um, so here's that mark select event. So when you passes it, it passes the sheet and also passes this get marks async function. So that will send to me the data that is rel relative to the mark that was selected. There we go. So let's make a new variable called data. And remember, it was get marks async, which means we want to wait on that to come back. And if we're using a wait, then that means this needs to be asynchronous as well. So we're going to wait on the event, and we're going to get marks async. Um, and I just know from using the reference, I was going to show you the, the whole scaffolding, but just for time's sake, I, I know that data passes back this uh, encapsulated data object. So I'm just going to do a shorthand here just to get down to the actual data nuggets. You can kind of ignore that for right now. OK, so let's go ahead and console log data so you can see what happens when I click on a mark. Now, I didn't mention this earlier, but I do have this desktop open in debugging mode. And you can learn how to do that. Here we go. If I can find our documentation. Perfect. Um, what you can do here is learn how to use the Tableau debugger. And what this does is it runs a debugger in the background so you can actually look at the console logs and look at different things that are happening with your application. I'm not going to go through how to do that today. Um, I do, we do have a website, a website, <laughs> a video on YouTube on how to get that set up so that you can do what I'm doing. But here I have my debugger and I can see my data dev right back extension. And here I can see anything that comes in my console log here. So let's go ahead and reload my extension to grab that new code that we just did. Boom, it's initialized. And I'm actually going to make this a little bit smaller. Let's see if we can do this side by side. Yeah, that's better. Now if I go back and reload my debugger and I click on something, we see the data for that mark. So here I see all the columns that I'm using on that mark. And I can see, there it is, the data for that mark as well. So I can see that this is requested in the bathroom. It's been open for 16 hours. There's low pressure, la, 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 all the data. So how this works is you need to find the relevant field in the columns data, data source here, the columns object. So in our case, we're looking for the request ID so we can pass it on. And then you return the index. Based on that index, I can then look up in the data object what that value is. So this particular mark, the request ID is 20. OK, you follow that? Hopefully you did. If not, it's recorded. So we're going to move along and grab that information over here. OK, so let's find first the index or that nine number. I need to know which of these fields to, to pull from. So we're going to look through the columns, find the request ID, and return the index. Select index equal 
we're pulling data here, and then we're going to say columns. Remember that columns object. And then we're going to find a particular column, specifically the column where the field name, is it capital? Yes, it is, is equal to request ID. And we're going to return its index. So let's just show that to you here. All right, we'll reload this. And if I choose a different one, whoops, what did I do? Equals do, 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 do. index data.columns.find. Oh, if you see it, now's the time to let me know. <laughs> oh, it's a space. There we go. Now, ha -ha. Make sure that you're actually following what the labels say in Tableau. We should probably do that. Let's try that again. Aha, there we go. So just so you know what happened there, I put in request underscore ID. It, the column is actually request ID space ID in Tableau. And here I'm pulling in the index from that particular column. I can then use that index to grab the data from the data object. So let's go back in here. And we're going to say uh, let request ID equal from data dot data object. We're going to grab um, the particular index value. Um, again, just because I know the structure of this, this is so data is an array. I want to just grab the first thing of that array, which is that one singular mark. And then within that data set for all of the things that are happening on that one mark, give me the particular field information from the index. And specifically, I want the value. So if I look back in here, you can see we've got data, right? That has zero because we only have one object, one mark that we selected on. If we had multiple marks, you'd see multiple of these uh, in here. And remember that JavaScript starts at zero. So within zero, okay, from there, I'm pulling in index nine that we found out earlier, and then I'm returning whatever that value is. So if I try this again now, if I return the request ID, one more time, reload. I'm getting 17 because this particular request is request 17. Click over here, we're getting request 20. Click over here, we get request 1, 2, etc. Wonderful. Now I can actually send that to open up the pop up for this page. Because remember, I need to know what that ID is when I'm opening the page. Cool. Moving along. So we've got the request ID. Two more steps to go. Now, what URL I need to actually open with. We need to make sure that we're actually using the exact same URL as the base of the application. You cannot open a separate URL as in a different domain. So if your uh, extension is on, you know, myawesomeextension.com, you can't open, you know, extensionpart.2.com. It has to be the same exact domain. So I'm going to cheat and just use whatever the current location is. This is just a nice way that I usually um, find that domain because if I change it, if I move this project around, if you guys remix it, it'll just look at what the current uh, domain is and just pop that into the URL for us. So window.location.origin and then slash request slash and now I need the actual request ID, which I have from earlier here. I don't know if you guys, I keep pointing at the screen like you guys can see me pointing, well, where I'm pointing. Um, but here we have the request ID. So that, this URL is going to be the exact same thing that we've been creating over here. So request slash whatever request I clicked on. So now that I have the request ID here, um, I'm going to go ahead and actually open the dialog. So let's pop open that dialog. Going back to our documentation here, you can find within the UI object, the display dialog async, and it takes a URL, it takes a payload, and it takes some options. So we're going to go ahead, I'm just going to copy it from here, make it faster. And I'm actually going to 
return that data. So whenever you close a pop-up with the Tableau Extensions API, it sends you, you can send some data. So remember back here, I said I was sending whether or not we actually successfully updated that row. So in here, I can say, well, whatever that request was, that's the closed payload. I want to know what that information was. So in a real life example, you can send back true or false. And maybe if it was a false uh, return, you could say, oh, no, something has happened. You know, you need to change X, Y, Z. Now, this is going to pop up at a specific URL, which we already have. So we'll use URL. I don't need to send it anything because I'm already using the URL to specify my request ID. So I'm going to leave that just as null. And I'm going to set my height and width here to you know, just 600 by 450. Not like I've never done this before. Sure, just made this up right now. <laughs> and what that's going to do is pop open our uh, pop-up dialog. So let's test that out. We're almost there. Oh goodness, I was hoping we could get it done faster than this, but we're doing we're doing okay. You guys are still hanging in there, so that's great. So reload. And now, if I click on something, oh, maybe. Uh oh. Reload that again. It is a live demo, so if I do something wrong, we'll find out what it is. Oh no, what did I do? Tableau extensions, la la la. Are we getting any errors in the console? No. How about over here? Hmm. Interesting. Let me check my notes. Actually, let me check the comments. Does anyone know off the top of their head? Did I skip something here? Did I miss something? No. You guys aren't helping me out in the comments? Oh, goodness gracious. Let's see. Close payload. Had the payload. Got a URL. Request ID. Well, how I would debug this normally? Let's see. I would maybe just console out. I usually use breakpoints, but just for today, I'll just console out this URL, make sure that the URL is working properly. Let's reload. This is live debugging. <laughs> and let's see what happens here when I'm doing that. Oh, there we go. Okay, maybe it just wasn't, it was just taking its sweet time. Maybe it just hadn't loaded up or something. Maybe it's just running a little slow. Hmm, okay. That's still working correctly. And this is still working correctly. Yep, okay. So what am I missing? Let me just reload that one more time. There we go. Okay, not sure what happened. Maybe there was a glitch with glitch. I don't know, but <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're moving along. So as you can see, I'm pulling up this exact particular request. I can see that it's coming from unit 301, area kitchen, no one's assigned. It's working perfectly. Just one more thing we need to tie in. So we already know that our update button works. And if I actually, if I can go back and click on one of these. If I update one of these guys, um, it's gonna close the dialog, but nothing happens. Nothing gets changed here, nothing happens. So what we want to do when we actually close things, we wanna refresh that data. So here we're gonna say, if our close payload is true, oh, payload. And remember that's just coming from, did you update something successfully? So if it was successful, let's go ahead and grab the worksheet, the, the data sources the data sources and we can grab that from event because remember event not only gives us this nice get marks async function it also returns what worksheet you actually selected so i can say data sources event dot worksheet and then we can get data sources async and again this is also in the documentation that reference what we get from here is a list of data sources just so you guys can see what that looks like Actually, I'm gonna just show you in the documentation. That'll be faster for sake of time. You will get do, 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 a array of data sources that have um, some information about the data source, and then you have this function to refresh the data source. So 
what we're going to do is once we have the data source, now I only have one data source in this entire workbook, so I can just say return the first data source. And again, remember zero is first in JavaScript. So return the first one. And with that, just refresh it. Async. There we go. Um, I can also say if something went wrong, um, I could say, you know, alert, you know, oh no, there's an issue, but we're going to skip that for now. So review, we have our URL that's opening this particular form that we've already set up. It's passing in the request ID based on the mark selection that I have and that data. Once it's closed, it's going to update that data and it's going to then hit refresh for us on the data source. So, moment of truth, let's see it in action. I'm going to reload my extension. And let's say we're going to assign, I'm going to open this a bit fuller here. We're going to assign this, um, this first one here on 1B. We're going to say that it's signed and that it's in progress. So I'll say, let's assign it to uh, Sophia. And it's now from requested in progress. And then there's low water pressure. I can say comment, 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 la la la. I hit update. That's going to close the dialog. And then our index is going to automatically refresh the data. So we should be seeing, come on, any second now. Of course, if it doesn't work, I'm going to have to go back and debug it. But we'll give it a chance. Nope, nothing. Well, let's check the errors. <laughs> what did I miss? Oh, something's going on. At least I got the errors this time here. What did I miss, guys? Let's see. Data sources, event at worksheet, get data sources async, do, do, do. And I am passing the right request ID. Oh, boy. Well, let's take a look at this. Can't read property of undefined. Okay. Well, that's happening in here. So for some reason, our index is undefined. Well, let's try it one more time. Because you know what? The reload worked last time. So why not try it again? Let's see. OK, so it did actually do the update. So that's good. That part did work. It seems like on my way back, let's see. On the way back, it didn't do the refresh. Well, let's try it one more time. Hit update. And, oh, we're so close. Hmm. Any ideas in the chat? Now's the time. <laughs> no, there's no comments in the chat at all. Oh, goodness. Let's see. Live debugging happening here. So let's see. We've got our index. That's working. Refresh async. So something was happening with the event here. But for time's sake, I'm going to just refer to my full build that I have over here and just compare and see if I missed something. Do, 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 do. Data sources. That's fine. I've got my event. That looks good. Okay. Console log out the URL one more time. I guess this is part of the learning, right? You get to see me debug this as we go. Okay, let's keep that open and put this on the other side over here. Okay, so when does that error happen? Okay, so that it doesn't happen until I come back. I hit update. OK, so it's happening on the refresh. OK, so it's saying that the actual, that this data sources here is, is the problem. So let me see. Did I botch this piece here? That looks like the issue. So data sources. Let's try that. Reload. Reload. Oh my goodness gracious. Oh, I did. <laughs> I've been saying it the whole time and then I totally forgot to do it myself. Remember, these are asynchronous functions. You need to wait for them to get resolved. If you try and run the refresh before you actually have the data source, it's not going to work. So make sure that you actually wait for that to happen. Make sure you put the await in there. Oh my goodness. Well, you know it's live, guys. It's it's real coding going on here. 
Now, crossing my fingers, send me all the good fields. This sh should work. Here we go. You know what? One, re one more reload just for good luck, for good measure. All right, let's try it one more time. Let's do, let's do 301 this time. So 301, unassigned, requested. We'll assign it to Eric this time. He's in progress. They've got some notes. I hit update. Oh, yeah, I think it's happening. Yes, there we go. So now we've got that refresh happening. And once it's done, there we go. Now we see our data is up to date and in progress. Just to show it to you again, let's say I want to unassign one of these. I can go back into my tool here and I can say this is not assigned. Maybe it's requested. Maybe there's no comments. Hit update. In the background, it's refreshing. I'll wait for that to refresh and I'll see that instantly here on the dashboard. There it is. Now we've got it working. And that, my dear friends, is how to build a very simple but effective right back extension. I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the chat. Um, <laughs> thanks, I appreciate it. I appreciate that you got this. Thanks for hanging in there with me. <laughs> yes, uh, the code will be available afterwards. Um, let's see here. Could you please explain the extensions that you put on your report? Yep, sure. So this, remember that this extension here, this little piece of the extension is just the index page. And really for this type of thing, you don't wanna have something taking up precious real estate on your dashboard. So honestly, once you have this running, I wouldn't, like if this was a real thing that I was using, I wouldn't even have this showing up. I would say change the size of this. And I tell people to do this all the time. Change the size of this to be one pixel by one pixel and it doesn't even show up anymore, but it's still running in the background. So if I click on something, it's still there and it's still listening. I can still make those updates and it'll refresh, but it won't take up space on your dashboard. So it's kind of like a headless extension or like an invisible extension, if you will. Um, cool, so to wrap up, go back in here. Just another reminder to make sure that you sign up for the developer program. That's how we run all of these events live and in person. If you want to know what's coming up, um, you can sign up there. We do hackathons all across the country and we'll be doing one in London this year as well. So check it out. See if we're coming to a city near you. I think we're going to Chicago, New York, oh goodness, Bay Area, London, and there might be one more, I can't remember. <laughs> but So we do a bunch of events um, and cool things like this. Let me know if you're interesting, if you're interested in more things like this. I think I saw Tucker in the chat asking about Hyper API. If that's something that's interesting to you, let us know, send us some feedback. Um, and of course, if you just don't feel like making your own extension, there are extensions in the gallery that you can uh, use and purchase to do something similar. So you, if you're watching this today and you say, wow, that's really cool. I'd love to have this for my company, but we don't have the resources, um, I can recommend for you a couple. There's one in particular I really like is by m2 dot and if you go to extension gallery .com, you can check out their form builder and we also have from expand it we've got right back they've got a free version and a full version for for your use there as well so if you're just like keisha this is great but i don't, I don't really want to build it my, myself there is that for you there as well and this entire project i have filled out and finished is here so if you want to take a look at the full finalized uh, project i will be deleting the data dev live one eventually because if we do this in the future i'll be keeping that as my main live location but everything we do will be uh, visible to you so I'll have that over there for you guys to take a look at but that's about it. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I'm, I wasn't sure if anyone was going to show up today. So thank you for joining us and participating and um, watching. And I will be here for another few minutes if you have any questions. And maybe I'll see you next time or I'll see you at a hackathon. Until then, take care.